Well, welcome to episode 299 of 10-Minute Record Reviews, and this time I'm going to talk about this record by the Leroy Vinegar Sextet from 1958 uh, contemporary records, Leroy Walks, and this is an original American 1958 mono pressing, which apparently at one point cost somebody 25 cents. Leroy Vinegar was a double bass player, self-taught, who came to prominence in the West Coast cool jazz scenes out in LA in the 1950s and 1960s. He's a very traditional straight-ahead bass player. His signature walking style was the foundation of an impeccable sense of swing, and he's gone on to influence several generations of bass players. This record is his debut. It's a pleasing and varied slab of cool jazz, a very solid lineup, and perhaps needless to say, it's a record to savor if you're a fan of jazz bass. Leroy Vinegar was born in July 1928 into a family which was fairly musical. He had siblings, two sisters, who also played piano, and in theory that was going to be his path. But a friend of the family, who would often come over and jam, left a bass at the house on the regular, and Leroy began to play with that, and from there his path was set. He never looked back. As he entered adulthood, he became a fixture on Indiana Avenue, the center of black jazz and black culture in Indianapolis, but he really wanted to go further and play in the big leagues, as it were, even though at the time there were still plenty of great players in Indianapolis. He was, of course, a contemporary of people like J.J. Johnson, the trombonist, and the Montgomery brothers. Ultimately, that meant pursuing a career in either Los Angeles or New York. So, as he was still developing his trade, he decided to take the interim step of moving to Chicago. So he moves there in 1952, but rather than the stepping stone he imagined it would be, Chicago ends up being a huge challenge, because there are tons of great musicians there, a huge music scene, but nonetheless, Vinegar had too much talent and he was progressing too fast to stay on the sidelines for long. He ends up getting a gig at a famous jazz club back in the day in Chicago, a place called the Beehive as part of the house band, which was a great situation to be in because he would end up backing all kinds of serious A-list talent that would come through town. He got to play with Johnny Griffin, with Ben Webster, with Lester Young, with Sonny Stitt, with Charlie Parker. He also played occasionally at another Chicago jazz club, the Blue Note, and it was there that he met and backed up Art Tatum, and Art Tatum ends up being his ticket to the big time. And he says to Vinegar, I need you in my trio, would you join and come out with us to LA? Well, what's the guy gonna say? So he says yes. So in August 1954, Vinegar moves out to LA, originally with Art Tatum. His playing begins to stand out immediately, not just his tone, which is fantastic and woody, but also his rock steady sense of timing. And he plays with people like Kenny Drew, with Hampton Hawes, and with an old friend of his from Indianapolis, the piano player, Carl Perkins. On top of this, his timing was really good because in the mid-50s, black musicians were getting more and more work in recording sessions, and Vinegar very quickly becomes a first-call bass player for all of the major and minor West Coast labels. It's generally accepted that there were two real secrets to his success. First of all, obviously, his playing, and in particular, his signature walking style, very distinctive, four beats to the bar, ascending or descending, and with an absolutely locked-in sense of rhythm. As I mentioned, it's a fairly traditional approach to the bass, and it's kind of ironic that he should be doing so in LA at the time and building himself a career, when at the same time, in the same town, you have Scott LaFaro and Charlie Hayden, two bassists who were gonna turn the concept of what you did on the bass upside down in the next few years, also playing their trade and starting a revolution in the process. The way that he developed his walking style was actually fairly accidental, or at least an accident of the path of his development as a musician, because when he first began to play, because he was not confident as an improviser, because he'd never studied the bass formally, he just picked it up, he would avoid soloing per se, and he would just keep on walking, but he had such a way of doing that, and such a rhythmic way of doing that, that his bandmates actually really began to dig that. So from that point on, whenever the solo turn came to him, he would just keep on walking, which in theory, most bass players can do in their sleep, but in Vinegar's hands, that turned into something special. The other reason usually given to explain his success is his personality. He was warm, he was gregarious, easy to get along with, but he was also focused, disciplined, committed to the job at hand, and so in other words, he's completely reliable and talented, he is a producer's dream. As a consequence, in the second half of the 1950s, Vinegar records with pretty much anybody of note in the West Coast scene. And in truth, his career as a sideman alone would have been fulfilling for most musicians. Some of the West Coast cool jazz classics he appeared on include West Coast Jazz with Stan Getz and Shelley Mann, Serge Chaloff's Blue Surge, the Chet Baker Russ Freeman Quartet, Sonny Rollins and the Contemporary Leaders, and a whole bunch of others. 
He was also, at different points, part of some excellent groups, including Les McCann's late 1960s combo, and he's present on that fantastic record, which was kind of made on a whim at the Montreux Jazz Festival, Swiss Movement. But his career as a leader is also substantial, beginning in 1957, when Les Koenig, the supremo of contemporary records and a real champion of the whole West Coast scene, asked Vinegar, who had already recorded for Koenig on a whole bunch of Shelley Mann records, if he would come in to make a record as a leader and... This is the product. This record is made across three sessions at Contemporary Record Studios in Los Angeles in July and September 1957. The producer is Les Koenig, and the record sounds fantastic, so it's no surprise to learn that the engineer is none other than Roy Dunan, arguably the greatest of all the West Coast jazz engineers. Leroy Vinegar, of course, is on bass. This is, as I mentioned, his debut, and he was quite nervous coming in. He wasn't sure that he'd be able to add the additional presence, but when Koenig said to him that what he wanted him to do was simply play a bunch of tracks that all had walk in the title, somehow this put him at ease. And it's true, all but one of the tracks on here have walk in the title. Walk on, would you like to take a walk? On the sunny side of the street is the sole exception. Walk in, walking my baby back home, I'll walk alone and walk in by the river. The rest of the sextet also deserve mention. Gerald Wilson's on trumpet. He's from Detroit. He's yet another product of the remarkable music program at Cass Technical High School. He cut his teeth in the pre-war orchestras. He then had his own big band orchestra in the 1940s, but he drifted in and out of music over the following 10 years, and he's largely considered to be a forgotten gem, somebody who never really achieved all of his full potential. Teddy Edwards is on tenor, and this is the first of many, many records that he and Vinegar would make together. The remarkable Victor Feldman is on this record playing Vibes. He's just 23 here, one of, if not the greatest mid-century English jazz musicians, certainly in the top handful, multi-instrumentalist, and he also, later on, interestingly enough, plays on the first seven Steely Dan records. Carl Perkins is on piano. I mentioned he's an old friend of Vinegar's from Indianapolis days. He'd played with Miles Davis. He played with Clifford Brown. He'd had polio as a kid, and so when he played piano, his left arm, he held parallel to the keyboard and played like this, and then he would hit the low notes with his elbow, uh, which gave him the nickname of the crab. Very sadly, he'd be dead within a year of making this record of a heroin overdose. Finally, on drums is a guy called Tony Baisley, for whom this is one of the very first jazz dates on which he recorded. He'd been in the Air Force in the mid-1950s, and when he was discharged, he'd played for about a year with Eric Dolphy, as Dolphy was just beginning to establish himself in L.A. Side 1 starts with Walk On, which is a sole original by Vinegar. Sets the tone for the whole record because Vinegar, while not soloing so much, still manages to be central to proceedings, if that makes any sense. And we're also introduced to Teddy Edwards' fantastic crisp tenor tone, and there's excellent soloing from all the melodic instruments. Next is the ballad, Would You Like to Take a Walk, which features Victor Feldman quite prominently on vibes. This is meant as a memorial tribute to Art Tatum, with whom Vinegar would often play this tune when he was in his trio. The last track on side one is On the Sunny Side of the Street, and this is an upbeat swinging arrangement of an upbeat swinging number. The lineup gives you a great range of textures, and there's a whole bunch of short, snappy 16-bar solos that will just make you feel happy. Side two starts with Walkin', which is a glorious mid-tempo tune which swings as hard as anything on the record. Walkin' My Baby Back Home has a great arrangement by Feldman, and again, more great soloing. Next is I'll Walk Alone, which might be the weakest track on the record. As the title suggests, the focus is very much on Vinegar with Perkins supporting on piano. It's let down, I think, by the arrangement, or lack thereof, because it all seems a bit cobbled together as a tune. But the arrangement is not an issue on the very last track on the record, Walking by the River, which has a spectacular arrangement by Feldman. It's a really tight, swinging little number that closes out a really happy little record. On this channel, I've often talked about some of the game-changing records and musicians from late 1950s who were seeming to reinvent jazz every six months. This is not one of those records. There is no modal jazz here. There is no free jazz here. Quite the opposite. This is a superb example of swinging cool jazz played by an excellent lineup. And the reluctance of the leader to showboat on this record yields a very democratic outcome because there's all kinds of room for the members of the sextet to shine individually. It swings all the way through, it's greatly elevated by Feldman's arrangements, and I think it's an excellent addition to any 50s jazz collection. For me, it's four to five stars.